afternoon. So one morning back in 2010, I've got a phone call from a friend. He said that he was starting a new company. The business was not going to be simple, but if I had joined him, technically, I could do whatever I wanted. I agreed just like that. In this presentation, I want to show you what I've got myself into. The story of a company called Internobus, and especially the domain-driven design side of this story, since at Internobus we employed DDD from the very first day the company was founded. But first, as well-behaved DDD practitioners, we have to start from the business domain. So what the hell is Internobus? Let's say you're producing a product or a service. Internobus allows you to outsource all your marketing-related chores. It will advertise your product, collect leads, call them to close some sales, and finally optimize this whole flow to make sure that we are maximizing the profits both for our clients and Internobus itself. That's the system that I signed up to build that morning. Now, since we were a self-funded company, we had to get rolling as fast as possible. So for the first version, we had to implement the first third of that value chain. Now, to be honest, I was overwhelmed by this business domain, and I had to find a way to wrap my head around all those complexities of that business. Now, fortunately, not long before we started working, I got a book that promised just that. And of course, I'm speaking about Eric Evans's seminal work, Domain-Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. Honestly, this is one of my favorite books. But I also have to say, for me, it wasn't an easy book to read, you know. But luckily, I had that feeling that, OK, I've got a really strong grasp of this DDD thing just by reading the first four chapters. Guess how the system was initially designed? Well, its architectural style could be neatly summarized as aggregates everywhere. Creative agency, advertiser, publisher, website placement zone, each and every noun in the requirements was proclaimed as an aggregate. And all those so-called aggregates resided in a huge, lone, bounded context. Yeah, the same monolith that everyone warns you about now. nowadays. Sorry. <laughs> and of course, those were no aggregates at all. They didn't provide any transactional boundaries and had very little behavior in them. It was just a typical anemic domain model that only described the data structures. All the behavior was there in a huge, enormous service layer. Now, frankly, this design is like by-the-book example of how not to do domain-driven design. It's a complete architectural disaster. However, things looked quite different from the business standpoint. From business's point of view, this project was considered a huge success. Because despite that imperfect architecture, and despite our very unique approach to quality assurance, we were able to deliver working software in a very aggressive time to market. How did we do it? And the answer is ubiquitous language. We somehow managed to come up with a robust ubiquitous language. None of us had any prior experience in online marketing, but nevertheless, we could hold a conversation with domain experts. We understood them, they understood us. And, you know, to our astonishment, those domain experts, they turned out to be really nice people. <laughs> they really enjoyed and appreciated the fact that we were willing to learn from them and their experience. And this smooth communication allowed us to grasp the business domain in no time and to implement all of its complexities in code. And yeah, again, it was a big and scary monolith. But looking back, for two developers in a garage, it was just good enough. Again, working software in a very aggressive time to market. Now, this diagram kind of sums up our understanding of domain-driven design at that stage. We had a ubiquitous language and an anemic domain model in a monolithic bounded context. 
as, as time passed, leads started flowing in, and suddenly we were in a rush. Our sales agents needed a robust CRM system, a customer relations management system to work with. That CRM had to aggregate all those income and leads and distribute them uh, across multiple sales desks around the globe. The CRM had to also integrate with our clients' internal systems, both to complement our leads with additional information and to notify the clients about changes in the leads' life cycles. And of course, the CRM had to provide as many optimization opportunities as possible, because again, that what, that's how we made money, by optimizing that marketing flow. So since all these requirements didn't quite fit any existing off-the-shelf products, we decided to roll out our own CRM system. And our initial implementation approach was the good old DDD Lite. We said that we are gonna call every noun and aggregate and just shoehorn them into the same huge monolith. This time, however, something felt wrong right from the start. We noticed that all too often, we were adding awkward prefixes to aggregates names, like CRM lead and marketing lead, marketing campaign and CRM campaign. And interestingly, we never use those prefixes in conversations with domain experts. Somehow they always understood the meaning from the context. And then one, one day it dawned on me that, hey, there was something about context in that blue book. So I went back and this time I read the DDD book cover to cover. I finally learned that the bounded context solve exactly the same issue that we had experienced. They protect consistency of the ubiquitous language. Also, by that time, Von Vernon's book came out, and after reading it, I understood that aggregates aren't just data structures, but they play a much more important role by protecting the consistency of the data. So we decided to take a few steps back and redesign our CRM solution to reflect these revelations. So first of all, we divided our monolith into two distinct bounded contexts, marketing and CRM. Now, we didn't go crazy with microservices here or anything like that. We did the bare minimum to protect the ubiquitous language. However, in this new bounded context, we're not going to repeat the same mistakes we did in the marketing context. No more anemic domain models. Here, we would implement a real domain model with real by-the-book aggregates. In particular, we promise that each transaction will affect only one instance of an aggregate. Instead of an ORM, the aggregate itself will define its transactional scope, and the service layer will go on a very strict diet, and all the business logic will be moved to the corresponding aggregate. aggregate sorry. <clears throat> and, you know, we were so enthusiastic about doing things the right way, but soon enough, it became apparent that modeling a proper domain model is damn hard. Relative to the marketing context, everything took much more time. It was almost impossible to get the transactional boundaries right the first time. We always had to try out at least a few models, test them out, only to figure out later that the one that we hadn't thought about before was the correct one. So the price of doing things the right way was very high for us, a lot of time. And sooner than later, it became obvious to everyone in the company, no chance in hell we are going to meet those deadlines. And then our management decided to help us. They offloaded implementation of some of the requirements to DBAs. Yeah, store procedures. And this one decision did so much damage. And not because SQL is not the best language for describing business logic. No, the real issue was a bit more subtle. This situation produced an implicit bounded context with its boundary dissecting one of our most complex business entities, the lead. The result was two teams working on the same business component 
implementing closely related features, but with minimal interaction between them. And of course, there was no ubiquitous language, right? Literally, each team had its own vocabulary to describe, it, to describe the business domain and its rules. Conway's law kicked our asses big time. Those models were inconsistent, there was no shared understanding, knowledge was duplicated, the same rules implemented twice here and there. I rest assured, when that logic had to change, all those implementations went out of sync just like that. A complete nightmare. Needless to say, the project wasn't delivered anywhere near on time, and was full of bugs. Bugs that corrupted our most precious asset, our data. The only solution for fixing that mess was to completely throw away the old implementation and rewrite the lead aggregate from scratch, this time in the proper boundaries. To sum it up, at this stage, our understanding of domain-driven design looked like this. Ubiquitous language, a bounded context to protect the integrity of the language, and instead of an anemic domain model everywhere, a proper domain model everywhere. And of course, a crucial part of DDD is missing here. And I'm talking about subdomains, their types, and their effect on implementation strategies. Initially, we wanted to do the best job possible, but we ended up wasting lots of time and effort by, by, uh, by trying to build domain models for supporting subdomains. So, as Eric Evans put it, not all of a large system will be well designed, and we learned it the hard way, and we wanted to use that acquired knowledge in our next project. So after the CRM was rolled out, we've noticed that there was an implicit domain spread across marketing and CRM. Whenever the process of handling incoming customer events was modified, we had to introduce changes both in marketing and in CRM. Now, since conceptually this process didn't belong to any of them, we decided to extract it, uh, this logic into its own dedicated bounded context event crunchers. Now, since we didn't make any money out of the way we moved that data around, and we couldn't use an off-the-shelf solution here, it looked pretty much like a vanilla supporting subdomain. And we designed it as such. This time, nothing fancy. Just some simple ETL-like transaction scripts. And actually, this solution worked great for a while. Because as our business evolved, we implemented more and more features right here. BI people asked to put a flag to mark a new customer, to put another flag to mark an existing customer in an external brand, etc., etc. And eventually, all those simple flags have evolved into a real business logic with complex rules and invariants. Now, guess what happens when you implement a complex business logic as an ETL script. You know what happens? This happens. Yeah. So, what started as an ETL script grew to be a fully-fledged core business domain. And since we didn't adapt our implementation strategy, we ended up with a huge ball of mud. Each modification to that code base became more and more expensive, quality went downhill, and we were forced to rethink our implementation. We did it about a year later. By that time, the business logic grew so complex it could only be tackled with event sourcing. So we refactored this code into an event source domain model with other bounded contexts subscribing to its events. And we had a very similar experience in another project. One day, our sales desk managers had asked us to automate a simple yet tedious procedure that, until then, they had been doing manually, calculating commissions for sales agents. Again, it started pretty simple. You know, once a month, just calculate the percentage of each agent's sales and send that payment report to the managers. As before, we contemplated whether or not that was our core business domain. The answer was no. We are not inventing anything new here. We're not making money out of this process. 
And if there was an option to buy an existing implementation, we definitely would do it. So not core, not generic, but a typical supporting subdomain. So again, we didn't go crazy over its design. Some active record objects orchestrated by a smart service layer. Now, once this process became automated, boy, did everyone in the company become creative about it. Our analysts wanted to optimize the heck out of it. They wanted to try out different percentages to make them functions of sales amounts and sales prices and other business criteria, etc., etc. Guess when this implementation has broke down? And again, it did break down. The code base became an unmanageable ball of mud. Adding new features turned to be more expensive, bugs started to appear, and when your project deals directly with money, even a small bug can bring some big, big outcomes. So, as with crunchers, at some point we couldn't bear it anymore. We had to completely throw away the old implementation and rewrite it from ground up, this time as an event-sourced domain model. But let's see what happened here. Just as in the case of event crunchers, the business domain was initially categorized as a supporting one. But as the system evolved, it, gra it gradually mutated into a core business domain. We found ways of making money out of these processes. However, there is a striking difference between these two bounded contexts. For the bonuses, we had a ubiquitous language. And even though the initial implementation was based on active records, we could still have a ubiquitous language. You know, CRUD is not a bad word if your domain experts are using it, so... We built that ubiquitous language. But as the complexity grew, the language got more and more complicated as well, until at some point it could no longer be modeled as active records. And this allowed us to notice the need for a change in the implementation strategy much, much earlier than in the case of crunchers. We saved a lot of time and effort here by not trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, thanks to the ubiquitous language. That's what our vision of DDD looked like at this point. Almost a classic one. Ubiquitous language, bounded context, different types of subdomains, and implementation strategies according to the type of each subdomain. Now, let's see what we had learned from this experience. So, first of all, the ubiquitous language. For me, ubiquitous language is the most important part of domain-driven design. This is the core domain of DDD. The ability to speak the same language with domain experts proved to be indispensable for us. It turned out to be a much more effective way to share knowledge than documents, tests, and even Jira. And more than that, the ability to hold a conversation with domain experts for us was a major predictor of project success. Like in our marketing context. When we just started, our implementation was far from perfect. But that robust ubiquitous language compensated for that architectural shortcomings, and we were able to deliver the project's goals. In the CRM context, we screwed it up. Unintentional, unintentionally, we had two languages describing the same business domain. This led to lots of problems, and even though we, we've tried to have a proper design here, because of all those communication issues, we ended up with a huge mess. The Event Crunchers project started as a simple supporting subdomain, so we didn't invest in the ubiquitous language. When the complexity started growing, we regretted that decision big time. Even though we had to redesign this project from scratch, it would have taken us much less time had we initially started with the ubiquitous language, like we did in the bonuses project. Here, the business logic became orders of magnitude more complex, but the ubiquitous language allowed us to notice the need for the change in that implementation strategy much, much earlier. And speaking of supporting subdomains, it doesn't really matter what kind of business domain you're working on, core, supporting, or even generic. 
My take on it right now is that ubiquitous language is not optional for any of them. Now, let's talk more, a bit more in depth about business domains and their types. We all know that according to DDD, we have three types of business domains. The first one is core, the stuff that the company does differently from its competitors to gain competitive advantage. Second, supporting subdomains, the stuff that you do differently from others, but it doesn't provide any competitive edge. And finally, generic subdomains, the stuff that all companies are doing in the same way. Now, it's a common practice to use this categorization to drive design decisions. For the core domains, use the heavy art artillery. Build a domain model with DDD's tactical patterns or with event sourcing. Supporting subdomains can be implemented with some rapid application development framework, and generic subdomains, in many cases, are cheaper to buy or to adopt from open source than to implement yourself. However, this model didn't work well for us. And the thing is, companies, and especially startups like ours, tend to change and re reinvent themselves over time. You know, businesses evolve, new profit sources are evaluated, others neglected, and sometimes unexpected opportunities are discovered. As a result, business domain types change accordingly. Speaking of our company, I think I have experienced almost all the possible combinations of such changes. For example, event crunchers and bonuses. Both of them started as supporting subdomains, but once we discovered ways of making money out of these processes, they became our core business domains. Therefore, instead of making those design decisions based on domain types, we ended up preferring to reverse this relationship. For each business domain, we started by designing its implementation strategy. No gold plate in here. The simplest design that will do the job. And from that design, we deduced the business domain's type. And we found this approach to be beneficial in multiple ways. The first benefit is less waste. Well, your implementation is driven by the requirements at hand. It's not going to be over-engineered, and it's not going to be under-engineered, as it happened for us in the bonuses project. Second, reversing this relationship creates an additional dialogue between you and the business. And the thing is, sometimes business people need feedback from us as much as we need feedback from them. Because if they think that something is a core business, but you can hack it with PHP over a weekend, then probably some questions should be asked about the viability of that business. On the other hand, what if the business domain is considered as a supporting by the business, but it can only be implemented with domain model or event sourcing? And that's where things get interesting. It might be that the business can employ this, bus uh, this domain to gain an additional competitive edge, but they do not realize it yet as it happened with our bonuses module. In such a case, you are actually helping the business to identify new profit sources and opportunities much faster. And I'm almost out of time, so to sum this whole story up, I want to compare the approach to DDD that we started with to the one that we ended up using. And the main difference, I would say, is we went from aggregates everywhere, all the way to ubiquitous language everywhere. And that was the beginning of the story of that company, Internovus. You can find the whole story, what happened during those seven years in this book, Domain Driven Design, the first 15 years. There is a chapter with how it started, what happened, what we've learned, much more heuristics, much more lessons and how that story ended. Also, shameless plug, uh, you can find this book, What is Domain Driven Design on O'Reilly's uh, online learning platform. It's a low commitment introduction to domain driven design, about 90 pages. 
really a short read with all the core principles and practices of DDD. And I'm out of time in two seconds. One, two, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>